I'm Harrison Ellenshaw. We came up with a main title idea that was pretty unique, uh, and it consisted of taking a thin piece of plastic and sucking it down into a form uh, on a piece of metal that had the word something wicked this way comes kind of etched into this metal. So there were little holes in the metal that would suck the plastic down into it and make it conform and you could see the lettering. Then we poured milk into that because it was white and the plastic was black. And we took an air hose and as we released the air and the the lettering came up to the surface because the plastic came up, we would spray some air across it and it would go out into this funny kind of form. So that's the transition part that you see between the two titles. And the rest was just the milk then uh, streaming off the edges. Then you print it in reverse and add the color and you have the, the main title. Something Wicked went into production about the same time that uh, Tron went into production. And as a result, I was working on Tron. Then when Something Wicked was finished, we had finished Tron, and I went away for a little while, came back again uh, during some of the reshoots for Something Wicked. Worked mainly on the effect sequences and did a couple of matte shots uh, for the show as well. I'm Steve Burham. I photographed Something Wicked This Way Comes in 1981. Uh, it was my second uh, picture at Disney. I started in 1964 uh, shooting wonderful world of color uh, television shows, the animal uh, segments that they used to do for that show. This opening sequence was a second unit uh, sequence photographed by Jan Kieser. Uh, I was in Oklahoma photographing uh, the Outsiders and Rumblefish at the time this was done and so Jan came in and did all the second unit work and some of the uh, scenes that had to be redone. I'm Ray Bradbury, and there were two versions of Something Wicked This Way Comes. One that was finished at Disney, and it couldn't be released because most of the important things were missing. We had a preview, and there was dead silence. So we did at least one fourth of the film over, and I said, rebuild the sets, rehire the actors, I'll write the narration, I'll help edit the last reel of the film, let's do it over and do it right. The narration was originally to be spoken by me. We did a uh, recording. I didn't do a very good job, I'm sorry to say. I've learned more about reading narration and performing as an actor in the 10 or 12 years since. So they brought in Arthur Hill, who did a splendid job, and it worked out very well. I was born and raised in Waukegan, Illinois. The town square in the film was built from the bottom up. Uh, it, it was on uh, the back lot. It existed for 10 years, was finally torn down. But you can imagine the feeling I had the first day I came out to the studio and walked into the middle of my own hometown where I had been as a child for many years of my life. It was a beautiful piece of work and I regretted it terribly when it, it finally disappeared. This is a set that was built uh, on one of the smaller stages. Uh, on this stage, there was the schoolroom set and there was the library set that we're gonna see later on. So you'll notice like the shadows that are cast long show you that it's, it's late in the afternoon. There were two versions of this picture. Uh, one version was the version that uh, I photographed for Jack Clayton and the studio felt later on that, uh, that there were areas that they thought were not clear and they wanted to uh, to either shoot additional scenes or shoot uh, completely different versions of scenes and you you see those things are represented in the picture. Uh, Harrison had a lot of responsibility in, uh, in handling all of that stuff. Effects animation was added to a great number of the sequences 
uh, to, uh, again, try to make the film make a little bit more sense visually and uh, take away some of the ambiguity. It was especially effective in the library sequence uh, on the glowing pages of the book. But in other areas, it was added uh, purely as a method to try to uh, create more sense of something in a visual way. We did these shots with a luma crane off of a camera car because we wanted to have the camera in the middle of things instead of off to the side. The next shot is also a luma crane shot. Now the luma crane was a special crane that was built by the French and it was like a long pole that had a remote control head. So it had a very, very long arm. It did not have the operator and the assistant on it. So it made it very light and very maneuverable. And it, we couldn't push it fast enough on track, so we put it onto a camera car and just gave it a, a very fluid uh, feeling. This was the time when they still had the low-speed film, the 5247. So uh, we didn't have any of the high-speed films, so we had to have a lot of the stuff actually happening because we couldn't manipulate things like we can now. All of this stuff on the back lot, we we tried to shoot in an overcast situation. We had three things that we did to accomplish that. One of them was that we shot very early in the morning or late in the afternoon, or we uh, silked over the uh, entire street. This is uh, the library set. It's on the same stage as the little uh, schoolroom set that you saw before. And again, you have the shadows of the low sun that kind of comes in and out at the end of the day in the fall. This library is very much like uh, a lot of the Dale Carnegie libraries that were donated to towns all over the country in the, uh, in the 20s. So it's a very ornate library and it's, uh, it's a wonderful design. It was very interesting to light. Jack Clayton, the director, had a very interesting method for casting children. What he liked to do, he told me, was that when he was in England, he would go and just sit in schoolrooms and uh, watch the kids. And then he would pick out somebody who he thought would be good for the picture. He wasn't really interested in, in trained actors or uh, kids who were professional actors. Uh, the studio wouldn't let him do that here, but he found these two little boys after a very, very long search, and he was very good at working with them. And he tried to play everything in long, single shots where they would actually play the whole scene out as opposed to cutting it up. The only time that he would cut it up would, would be when uh, they weren't very good in their performance or with their dialogue, but he, he preferred also to try to do it in the first or second take so they were spontaneous and didn't get uh, all choked up for saying the same thing over and over and over again. Can you hear? What is it? Listen, why don't you ever listen? I am. Like music. One of the elements we did here a lot was that we always had a lot of leaves to break up the ground and to keep the wind going. This is on one of the big stages they have over at Disney. It was before they broke up the stages. Uh, this stage is 200 by 300 and had a 45 foot high grid, which was not exactly high enough for this. And what I tried to do here was to do a soft kind of overcast uh, look. Now this reverse, is very convincing because we put a backing up behind uh, Royal Dano here and uh, lit that and kind of burned it out. This one. Yeah, it's his house. This is a good point to speak of Royal Dano, who played the lightning rod salesman. I had known him because he worked on Moby Dick. He played the part of Elijah, warning Ishmael and Queequeg not to go on that journey because of the mad captain, mad captain Ahab. And before that, he'd played a small role in the Red Badge of Courage for John Houston. So over the years, he had many, many roles, and this is one of his best ones. I liked the way that he delivered all the early lines about the arrival of the lightning and the threatening of the storms. Fine actor. Jim? Is that you, Jim? 
The other interesting thing is that all these sets are what you would call composite sets. In other words, the houses were built uh, in toto on the soundstage and uh, the rooms were inside. There were like three houses that were double-sided. The roofs were, were there. The kids actually played on, on the roofs. It made it very, very difficult because when you got into some of these rooms, uh, you couldn't uh, take all the walls off. My old Warner Brothers key grip, Emmett Brown, came up with a great solution for the, for the rooms that these little boys had up in the top of the eaves. We had the roofs so they would come off and he had uh, these chain motors that would take them off very, very efficiently. When you work with children, you only have them for eight hours a day. Uh, and that's total time. You can only work them four hours. The other time is uh, they have to be in school and they have to have recreation. So every time you do one of these scenes, uh, you have to be very, very efficient at doing it. And this picture had a very, very long schedule. For those days, it was 90 days. Of course, Disney was uh, very, uh, very attuned to doing pictures with children in them. So uh, they had it all scheduled correctly. But these pictures take a very long time because of the children. This again is a composite set situation. This is on the back lot where the interior uh, and the exterior are, are put together. That's how this whole picture was, was done. The scene was probably soaked over. The big longer shots you couldn't, you couldn't silk over, uh, but these smaller ones you could. And the bigger, the bigger longer shots where you see the entire square, we'd have to either shoot them first thing in the morning or, or uh, when the sun went down. We shot this uh, show uh, from, oh, October through December, I think. I can remember being called into Tom Wilhite's office, who was the head of production at Disney at the time, and he sat me down and he said, the uh, cinematographer says that we uh, can only shoot wide exteriors uh, early in the day or late in the day and the rest of the time he's going to have to put these transparent silks over the entire set. And he said, what do you think of that? And I said, well, he must have a reason that he wants to do the whole show uh, in an overcast kind of look. Then Tom said, well, isn't that going to be expensive? I kind of didn't want to get stuck in the middle because, yes, it seemed like it was going to be uh, somewhat problematic considering that there were children involved and I knew that there were eight hours. Um, working time and if you work the kids in the morning shot it means you wouldn't be able to get them in the afternoon shot but I think it was always uh, a bit of a mystery to uh, to studios and to studio executives when people have to uh, make accommodations to get a look and a feeling for a film that obviously requires something out of the ordinary like this one did and um, when people like Steve come up with the solutions that are that are required, it sets them back a little bit, and they're not quite sure if that's legitimate or not. But I assured him that uh, Steve knew what he was doing. This is a good example of how the composite set really worked, because we really had the rows, we really had the houses. We were able to take uh, Vidal across with the Luma Crane again, and take him all the way up to the roof, to the top of the roof with his friend. Now, I believe that the sky is a matted sky. I think we had a regular backing and you had to do some manipulation because we couldn't get it far enough away. The stage was too small. So this may be pulling a sky mat off yes. of a backing, yes. which in those days was considered really very difficult to do. And it shows because the mat kind of pinches in a little bit. This was shot late in the evening, probably about 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, you notice that there was a little piece of uh, stuff that, that stuck to the ground because we stuck down that piece of paper uh, so it wouldn't blow away so Jason could pick it up. for uh, the most beautiful woman in the world's hand. We actually had a ring that had a light in it, but it wasn't enough of an effect. 
wasn't bright enough, and as a result, later uh, on the, I guess what we call the second version, when the effects animation was added uh, throughout a lot of the show, this was enhanced with effects animation. This room is actually inside of the house, and it has a very, very low ceiling, but we were able to take out one of the walls to do this sequence. These rooms were very small, uh, and they were even a little bit smaller than a normal house to give it more of a cramped feeling. Now the reflection you're going to see in uh, Vidal's glasses from the burning piece of paper was done actually by uh, having a little uh, flame bar in front of his glasses and it just reflected in them. No effects, just done right there on the uh, set. I got to know Sam Peckinpah more than 20 years ago. And Sam always wanted to do something wicked this way comes. He said to me, who do you want to play the father? And I said, Jason Robards. I'd seen his work and admired it for many years. And Sam was a good friend of Robards. And we had a number of dinners and, and lunches over a period of years. But it didn't work out for me to, to work with Sam Peckinpah. But Jason Robards remained in my mind for many years. And when the casting for the Disney film occurred, he was the first name on the list. So um, map painting and uh, a moving sky. I think that, that may have been done by Michael Lloyd did most of the map paintings on this show. This is, this is all on the soundstage. This is, again, the composite set situation from the little boy's room to him going out. And all of this stuff is shot uh, on the back lot. That's the actual Disney water tower in the background. Of yeah, it had Greentown painted on it. I had a special filter uh, manufactured. It was a graduate filter, which is a filter that is not uh, covered completely with the color. It only goes up halfway and then kind of fuzzes out. And it was a, an 85 filter, which is the filter that uh, converts daylight to tungsten. What I did use it for was a dusk for night shot, where I used the 85 filter on the bottom let the top of the frame go blue, and then I used another kind of graduate filter, a neutral density filter, to make the sky go darker, and then I was able to light the silver tower with, uh, with very powerful light so it would burn through. One of the reasons for as much uh, animation and opticals and eff visual effects as there are in this was that it was perceived by the studio that the audience didn't understand uh, some of the uh, some of the film and so it was to make it a little bit more literal by adding some of these things It was Jack's original uh, concept that he wanted to do this picture very much like he did uh, the innocence where things were not clear that the information uh, Was not delivered until the end of the picture and so um, there was a uh, There was a difference of opinion in this, in this instance. Again, the composite, the composite sets. Well, the carnival's gone. The carnival's gone. The point of view across the rooftops of the train is also another visual effect, a combination of miniature and matte painting. This is on the back lot. That was shot with a second unit on location. At one time, this train was going to be a computer graphic image. In fact, a number of tests were done uh, for computer graphic image, imagery of the train, but certainly the technology was not uh, anywhere near what it is today. And I think even today, this would be a tough one to do as all CGI. We have the interactive light on their face, like there's light coming out of the windows of the train, so you get a feeling that there's something moving past them. There was nothing except a big, a big light with somebody waving a flag in front of it. Where was the train shot, Steve? I think it was shot in Northern California. It's one of the, it's that, it's that one, it's in the oh, gold country right. that yeah. they've used for movies for a long, long time. Again, more effects animation to try to make it clear that something's going on here that uh, is caused by the train, by the arrival of the train with nobody on it.
this railroad track be built out at the Disney Ranch. And they build it on a curve. That way, uh, you don't have to build so much track uh, because it just ends at uh, both ends. There's probably about 75 yards of track. Now, this is a good example of the difference between the studio, what the studio wanted to do, and what uh, Jack uh, had done. When the little boys came into position, uh, there was a big gust of wind came in, which was cut out of the sequence, and they're blinded momentarily, and then they see the carnival. You don't see the carnival uh, appear. The carnival's a miniature and a little matte painting in the foreground with some effects animation laid over on it. That whole crane down from the uh, Ferris wheel was not in the original version. The exterior of the carnival, most of it was done out at the Disney Ranch. The glowing you saw in the mirror maze, uh, I did physically with a dimmer. That was to, to give it a beckoning quality, a strange beckoning quality to the thing. I might add, when we look at the casting, the two boys, the young boy that plays Will reminds me of myself when I was 12, so naturally I felt a strong attraction to the casting here. A very, very fine piece of, of work. The uh, costuming on the film was very precise and evocative. With the Dust Witch, she was wearing a, a veil and, uh, and gloves that were made from spider patterns. It took a, a lot of searching for the studio to find and match the sort of cobweb spider uh, thing that we see on the screen. I thought that was wonderfully done. Now that was a, an additional uh, shot with the spider on the hand. Anytime you see the spiders, their photography that was uh, done after this one as well, I guess, right? Yeah. When we did our night sequences, our exterior night sequences, we always did them between about 5.30 and 8 o'clock at night because when we had the kids, that was the only time we could work them to. There were a couple of nights that we got special dispensation out at the Disney Ranch for the carnival, and um, we could work till midnight. This sequence right here is very typical of Jack Clayton's style of directing. It's played all in one. We're on a crane here. Jason comes in the door, and his son is waiting for him, and they have a father and son talk. There are about three or four places in this picture where they have father and son talks. And so this whole shot is played as, as one unit. You can only do that if you have actors who are are very good and you have a scene that works very well and is well written. The reason that it's rather daring to do it in one shot is it doesn't allow you to mix performances and if somebody doesn't give a perfect performance or something that the director wants throughout the whole thing, you have what uh, is called cutaways. You have no cutaways to go to and then come back to, let's say, a different take, an alternate take, and mix all the takes together and try to build the best performance out of all the various takes. So to do things like this all in one shot without cuts takes a tremendous amount of guts and courage as well as a tremendous commitment on the part of the director. And obviously, uh, you have to rely upon fabulous performances from actors. People really don't understand how hard this is to do. You'll, you'll notice on, on this situation, the way it was lit, I, that the, the little boy doesn't have any direct light on his face, and then I gave Jason Robards what they call the break on the key light because he's carrying most of the scene here. Uh, most of the emotion is in his face, so I wanted him, uh, his face to be a lot clearer than the little boy's. I mean, you see the little boy's face, but your attention goes to Jason Robards because he's the person in the scene who is uh, really making the, the confession. So the direction you put in the key light 
uh, has a lot to do with the character and the story, just not where you can put a light so it looks pretty. And again, it's directing the audience's attention to one character, not the other, that's, that usually is done by cutting to a close-up. It's a very long scene, plus it's got a dissolve on the end. This is a matte painting. This is the Disney Ranch. You see all this wonderful haze in the background? That's California smog. <laughs> we had a nice clear day here. It rained. In a way, it appears this film was blessed by the weather. It was because we shot it at the right time of year. It was supposed to be in, in the fall, and we shot it in the fall and in the winter. The only thing is that if you were on the East Coast, you wouldn't have the green trees in the background. You would have no leaves on the trees and it'd all be golden. Uh, I think the interesting thing about, uh, about this picture is the idea of fall. It is the characteristics of, of the light in the fall that you have a lot of overcast, you have a lot of soft light, that when you do see the sun is at a very low uh, arc to the horizon. It should just have that feeling if the picture is a fall picture. And there are only two or three ways to accomplish this. This is the overcast day, which is the luck of the draw. Early in the morning and late in the afternoon, which doesn't give you much time to shoot. And because we had the uh, children silking over the whole set to make the light soft was the best, most economical solution when you take everything into account. The only thing I can remember about that was that uh, I had to go and paint for some reason, I had to go paint the boards that were behind him um, because a clean plate hadn't been shot for that. So I was meaning to talk to you about that, Steve. <laughs> Gee, I'm sorry after all these years. <laughs> well, okay. You're like I said, it. we had our track <laughs> shoes on, Harrison, <laughs> and they pushed us right along. I came into this picture a little late. Uh, Laszlo Kovacs was going to photograph this picture, and uh, he dropped out in pre-production, and I inherited the picture. When I got there, the sets were on the stages, and uh, we started. When I was 12 years old, a carnival came to my hometown, and in the carnival was a gentleman named Mr. Electrico. He, and every night he sat in his electric chair and was electrocuted. He introduced me to all of the uh, strange and wonderful people, the illustrated man, the, the skeleton woman, the, the spider man, the acrobats. He was responsible for my life as a writer and indirectly with this film. He's at the center of the novel. I've turned him into a different kind of character, but he's there, along with the, the lightning rod salesman, who is another representation of the same sort of metaphor. Mr. Cressetti is played by uh, Dick Davalos, who was uh, had a very... Uh, interesting career. He started out uh, as a Warner Brothers contract uh, player and uh, was in uh, a lot of those James Dean pictures, Rebel Without a Cause and East of Eden, and, and uh, he was, he was a, quite a, a young, handsome, leading man. And of course, uh, Pam Greer hoped that uh, she was going to, uh, to break away from her image of the tough private detective with the gun. She wanted to, to change her image, and so that's why she took this picture. Number two. How this came to be a Disney project was in the mid-70s. I bumped into Kirk Douglas's son, Peter, and he said, do you have a film that you want to have made? I said, my gosh, I have a screenplay. And he said, well, send it over to me. By sheer coincidence, Jack Clayton had flown over from London. Kirk and Peter were having lunch with him, and they said, what would be your next film? And uh, Jack Clayton said to them, there's a novel I've read the last few years. It's called Something Wicked This Way Comes. That I would love to have as my next film. And Kirk and Peter were astounded because Jack didn't realize they had a screenplay done by me. So they put me together with, with Jack Clayton, working on an utterly new screenplay. They submitted the screenplay to various studios, couldn't find anyone interested, and finally went to Disney. Jack Clayton made quite a remarkable little film based on the Gogol story, The Bespoke Overcoat. I was very touched and impressed 
by his ability as a director. And a few years later, he did The Innocence, Turn of the Screw by Henry James. And that impressed me. So when it came time to try to get something wicked this way comes on the screen, by a remarkable coincidence, I wound up with Jack Clayton. I don't know whether you can see it or not on uh, on the on the video disc, but there's a little bit of pink light that's kind of was kind of coming out on uh, Sean's eye to kind of give you the feeling that something sensual was happening inside. The sequences of the boys at the carnival seeing things that boys are not supposed to see comes right out of my own background. When you're 12 years old on the edge of puberty and don't quite know what's going on, you begin to write about them and then you put them on the screen and I think there's a perfection here that works very well because one of the boys knows what he's looking at and the other boy uh, rejects it. I wrote a scene which was not used where the two boys going home at night come to a house with a window. It's on the second floor and Jim climbs a tree and looks in a theater of life you can't see what he's looking at. Someone's up there doing something, huh? A man and a woman. And in the novel, I don't tell you what he's seeing, but Will, standing at the bottom of the tree, yells at him, come down. We have a hint in the novel of the attraction that Jim has uh, of all these forbidden delights. And on the screen, of course, they did a much more obvious thing with dancing girls. The carousel and stuff was done on a sound stage, uh, and it was it was very interesting because it was an old, an old classic one that didn't run quite as fast as it was supposed to run, and uh, so we uh, we had to do some tricks to make it look like it went faster. Uh, this is this was shot in the days before uh, Steadicam, so this is actually done handheld. This shot because it was the only way we could get a camera in between these. Uh, these horses because they were so narrow. Now there's a very interesting trick here that makes uh, makes the uh, the strong man look stronger than he than he really is. You see the two hands coming in. He lifts the the boys up, and you see you see that he's carrying them. He's not really because they're standing on a a two by twelve that the grips are holding up. But then they just set it down and they're on the floor. Now, Mr. Dark is in the dark until he comes out and he, he wants to instruct the boys. You'll see him walk out into his light so you see his eyes. Symbolic of evil. Now, he is going to show the boys something magic. His tattoos move on his arm. And the way we did this was we, we merely had a 16-millimeter uh, projector that uh, projected a film of a kaleidoscope on his arm and then just matted it off so it didn't fall behind. It didn't uh, fall off onto the set. Again, as Harrison said, it's always best to do it the simple way if you can. Yeah, it's a remarkably effective shot. This is another example of the way Jack Clayton would direct and block a scene. It's played out more or less in one shot here. Uh, and he did that because he felt that, uh, that the uh, kids were much better and much more spontaneous if you did it in, in one or two takes. They didn't get stale with the dialogue. And this shot is just a continuation of the other master just to, to end it up. Again, you see the two shot with the little boys playing out, no close ups. If they can't find us, they won't. Come on. This is all effects. Yeah, and this is a matte painting. Uh, this, this transition was uh, created uh, 
uh, rather than, I believe, just a straight cross dissolve. Just again to try to open up the picture a bit. As far as the carousel is concerned, uh, we found a really great one. I believe it was in Long Beach. Uh, we took it apart and carted it across from Long Beach to Hollywood and put it back together uh, on the set and used it there. We had uh, a problem with the carousel. It's supposed to go very, very fast. And also we had a very kind of bland background. So what I did was that I put uh, everything on a chase unit. So it would get a feeling of movement. So things were moving against uh, objects. And of course, all of this has been optically uh, manipulated with the diffusion. This is a cascading effect where you just take a partial exposure of each succeeding frame and print it over the first frame. So as a result, you see a little bit of each image on each frame. So I had about a hundred uh, lights around the edge of the of the set that were all on a uh, theatrical chase circuit that gave you that feeling of movement when you when you see the little boys uh, get onto the carousel and it moves around. You can see that. You can see it on also on the shot when uh, uh, they're witnessing uh, the magic of the uh, of the carousel. You see the shadows changing behind them. I believe we also shot some of this stuff at different frame rates, but I don't remember what it was. When the carousel stops, then the, uh, the chase circuit stops. Jonathan Price is an exquisite and perfect Mr. Dark. He went on from this to do uh, dozens of other films. He appeared on Broadway and Miss Saigon. But his delineation of dark is right on the nose. This again is, is the back lot. This is a, uh, an effect of the, uh, of the barber pole on the little boy's face. It's not actually the barber pole, it's a, uh, it's a big drum that has, uh, has colored strips on it. Now this is the other side of the boy's house, of the boy's house uh, that's doubled on the same stage that uh, is supposed to be another street. There were about three houses, as I recall, on that on that stage, and they were they were double faced. You had the boys, two boys' houses on the other side, and this was the other Miss Foley's house in the other part of the street. Don't you lie to me, Jim. That's not what you want to do. You want to meet that that thing. Taking a book like Something Wicked This Way Comes and making it into a film, uh, and film being a very visual medium. Uh, creates a whole different set of parameters than the written word where it relies upon descriptive passages and your imagination uh, to tell the story. Uh, film sometimes is perceived by people as not allowing for imagination and that's a bit of a mistake because people can still have an imagination as well as incorporate all the visual imagery that is is part of the film. And sometimes studios feel that nothing should be left to the imagination. So it's always nice when you do have that fact, but that's what is part of the situation here with this film and why it went through so many modifications. It was where, where to add things that uh, the studio didn't have the confidence that the uh, imagination of the audience would, would uh, be adequate. He won't be in school Monday. Uh, he's sick. Oh? Yeah. See ya. Here it is again, the, the walking two shot with the two characters playing out the scene with no cuts. This horrible devil's hand and you touched it. Oh, shh. This little boy had a very tough time doing the scene. He was so young he didn't quite understand what was going on, but it's quite effective in the picture. 
It had been a long time since they'd done a feature at Disney of this scale. And so they didn't have all their power that they used to have. They had diverted a lot of their power to the computers that they used uh, for, uh, for their accounting for the, for the parks. So they had to bring in special generators because the stage was so big. We had 55,000 amps on the stage because the backing was 1,000 feet around. And uh, Jack also wanted to use a zoom lens. So in those days with the slow uh, 5247 film, which was only 100 ASA, you needed 200-foot uh, candles to be at F4. So it was a lot of light. This was the last picture that I photographed where you needed that much light because uh, the high-speed film came out directly after this. This is actually, that run down that side is the, is the opposite side of the stage, the opposite side of the buildings. What's the trouble, boy? Now here's another example of what you would call the Clayton touch, where a lot is inferred by what you see. You see the mother dancing with the salesman. Supper's over. It's late. Well, Again, played in one. With the man in the background. Okay. You hungry? No. It's all right, I guess. Jam? Well, just now, you know. You the interesting thing was, was because these were composite sets and there was a roof right down over the top of them. I had to develop some very, very small lights that, uh, that actually I found in a, in a catalog. They were projector globes. Uh, they use them now. Uh, they're the MR16 globes. And I had the machine shop at Disney make me some little housings. So I had about four of them. And I could stick them right up to the, to the ceiling to light these people underneath this uh, very low porch. A long time ago. About that strong old current that swept you way out in the middle of the river. And I stood there and watched, tied to the river bank and helpless. The sequence with the father and the son on the porch late at night was originally much longer, and the studio did a lot of cutting on it, especially toward the, the end of the sequence. But along the way, you can't tell it because you've got a series of of shots of the father and the son. They cut out some dialogue, which was very evocative. I guess she must have been all four years old at the time. I knew someone caught hold of me. Someone who wasn't me. This scene is a little more cut up, but you'll notice that most of it is done in this rolling master. When we did this, we laid what they call a big dance floor, which is a big uh, flat area. It was about maybe 12 by 12 that was very level and very supportive that we could put the dolly on so it would move uh, very, very smoothly. It's very difficult to uh, construct things on the stage because we had, uh, we had real grass that uh, had to be uh, changed out all the time on this, uh, on this set because it was inside. We had three sets of grass. We had a, a set of grass that was on the stage. We had a set of grass that was being watered outside in the parking lot, and another one that was drying out outside. And every night, the uh, the swing gangs, which are the uh, the set dressers, would come in and change out all this grass on this on the stage. It was 200 feet by 300 feet, so uh, it was quite a quite an effort. Every every time you wanted to do something on the grass. Titus close up in the picture is this scene because it's uh, the culmination of the re relationship between the father and the son. But at the very end of the scene in the novel and in the first version, he asks if the father wants to climb the lattice with him too and go back into the house that way. And as it was originally shot, the father does accept the challenge. The studio thought that made for a friendliness in the relationship which destroyed the tension, and they thought the audience wouldn't care enough about the father and the son if the father accepted the challenge. 
but it was my point that the son, at a certain point when the father slipped, had to reach down with his hand and save the father and pull him to the top of the lattice and the top of the roof and into the window. That means later the father has to finally save the son because you have the implication through the father describing the boy almost drowning that the father failed. He didn't do his job. He didn't dive in and, and swim out and save his son. So the, the irony is in this sequence, the son saves the father, and then at the end of the film, the father has to save the son. This again is on the second story of, of uh, these composite uh, sets. So we had had half the roof out on this and half the roof in. Very, very little room to maneuver. But again, a nice two shot, two good actors, good dialogue. You're in business. Oh, my Harry will be dead forever. Quiet, quiet. Quiet, quiet. Good night, Mom. Good night, darling. Well, this Harrison is where I where I first met you. You came and helped me out. We had some sodium vapor stuff to do, and only the people who worked for Disney had ever done any kind of mat work with sodium vapor. Yes. So you were in charge one day of, of showing me how to do it. And uh, you said, it's very simple, Steve. All you do is you just, you just turn on the sodium vapor lights and you hold up this dibidium filter and you look at it and the background goes black and it all works perfectly. And you're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, the simple things are often <laughs> the best. Uh, sodium vapor was uh, Disney's version of uh, traveling mat photography that uh, took the place of what normally would be done as a blue screen. The beauty of it was it created the mat, the silhouette, the holdout silhouette in the camera and didn't have to be done optically later on. It had its, uh, had its drawbacks, however, limited lens choices and things such as that. The effect on her eyes that uh, makes her go blind was something added uh, very late uh, in the post-production process. Originally it was uh, just the actress acting. Yeah. Again, to try to take away any uh, possible confusion. This was shot uh, at magic hour, so you'd have a little bit of density in the sky. Again, the composite set so you can see from one little boy's room to the other little boy going out. This is at the Disney Ranch. Using this low speed film and trying to light this much of an area at night is quite a, a chore. We had a lot of very, very large lights lighting all the trees in the background so it looked like there was some sort of uh, depth to the scene. Oh, so help me. I remember this when I'm what? When I'm older, darn it, older. You're older? I didn't mean. Oh, yes, you did. But that darn merry-go-round could make Mr. Cougar younger. This is a confrontational scene instead of just an information scene, so uh, Jack felt that it needed the coverage to punch it up a little bit. Your little mind, Jim Nightshade? You'd be two feet taller looking down at me. You ditch me. Wait! Those clouds are made by putting paint into a cloud tank that is clear on each side. Four and a half, five feet on one side, six, seven feet on another side. Uh, very thick plexiglass, but at least an inch thick. And it's full of water and you put paint in there and it gives you that cloud effect. This uh, sequence uh, where the little boys come in and to the freak show originally started with the two little girls that dollied around, you saw everybody, ended up with the two little boys uh, in this point of view shot. Then you saw this shot, this long shot, but the uh, editors decided it was probably too long for the sequence, so uh, they did it in this fashion. Uh, then you see all the specific shots of what has happened to all the people. 
In my novel, the boys see Mr. Cougar get on the carousel. They interfere with the progress of the machine, and Mr. Cougar uh, is transported forward so that he becomes almost a cripple. They put him in the electric chair to try to keep him alive. So it is not Tom Fury who occupies the electric chair, it's Mr. Cougar. Effects animation was added to a number of shots in this sequence, including this one where you see the effect of shattering glass as she opens uh, her costume and gown. All that is effects animation, hand drawn frame by frame to add more visual to the shot and give it more impact. And then uh, an effect needed to be added to this electrocution of this character. And a number of things were tried, including making a form of the character and, and putting a Tesla coil over it. But that really didn't work. It was very difficult to get a, a good exposure and to isolate the uh, electricity. A lot of effects work is uh, R&D, which uh, doesn't show up in the final final shot, but often shows you how not to do a shot. Uh, the results here are a lot of interactive light in addition. That's the reflected light on the different characters, which is effects animation added and uh, effects animation itself of the bolts of, of uh, electricity. Looks like the electricity in 20,000 leagues under the sea. Yeah, it does. <laughs> And then effects animation added on her face in that previous shot. The special effects people were glad to go back and look at the scene and see what could be done to enhance it. Uh, this is true all during the film, but especially in the latter part of the film, where we need to increase the intensity of the mystery of the carnival. This whole running uh, sequence is all second unit. This was all shot uh, in the Northeast. One of the things that's missing from the screenplay is the dust witch flying over the town late at night in a balloon, seeking for the two boys. And she passes over the houses and she reaches out with her hands on the wind and she feels and she guesses where the boys live. And Will has the inspiration to run out of the house with a bow and arrow set and lead the balloon away from his own house. And he fires the arrow at the balloon and kills the balloon and the balloon whiffles and, and dies like a giant elephant in the air and falls to earth, and the dust witch is defeated. Jim Nightshade, and take your hat off. It's a bad influence. Mom, chew butt mom me. It's a matte painting. You weren't able to photograph the whole set, couldn't get back far enough, so as a result it had to be a painting. It's kind of ironic that effects were added to some of these shots uh, in order to try to make more sense of the film audiences aren't stupid and they they know uh, what's real what's not real and and also what's part of the supernatural if you will that's going on and as it all kind of combines together uh, that's what makes film so remarkable now here's a reverse of the other situation the little boy's face has the break on the key light and the father's almost in silhouette Back in 1955, Gene Kelly, the wonderful choreographer dancer, invited me to a special screening. I went to see his film, Invitation to the Dance. When it was over, I walked home with my wife and I said, my God, I'd do anything to work for Gene Kelly. He's a genius. My wife said, well, why don't you find something in your files and write it up and send it to him? So I went through my files. I found a copy of a short story called The Black Ferris. I spent two months writing a screen treatment and screenplay called Dark Carnival. I gave it to Gene Kelly. He went to Paris and London and tried to get money to make the film and came home and said, I'm sorry, Ray, I couldn't find the money. I said, don't say you're sorry. I'm glad you tried. So I took three years and I wrote the uh, novel, Something Wicked This Way Comes. 
and uh, did other screenplays on it in later years. But if Gene Kelly hadn't inspired me in the first place, it would never have been done. From this point on, uh, you'll be seeing a lot of the new version of the film that was shot when the old version didn't work. This is the beginning of a sequence that was completely changed in the picture. When I photographed it uh, on the original principal photography, a hand comes down, a great big hand that kind of looks like the hand in, uh, in War of the Worlds. And it starts to open up the windows and both the boys are scared to death. And then they wake up and they realize it's just a dream. Now you see both the boys hear something and they can't figure out what it is. So they look out and you see the shadow kind of come across the boy's faces and it is past them. So now he has a chance to run to get to his friend's house to, to talk about what's going on. That This again, then he hides in the tree. It goes across again. He's clear. We just did that with a great big cutout that that had a cloud's edge and the, and the grips just threw it over it. The uh, mechanical effects people built a very large mechanical hand and it was wonderful. All the fingers were completely ar articulated. It bent, it moved in and out and it was quite a spectacular device and it was, it was very effective in dailies. I guess when they saw it in the, uh, in the context of the picture they didn't think it was scary enough. This all becomes uh, another sequence with spiders. And you'll notice that uh, the wig starts to change on uh, the boy's hair because this was shot almost a year later. The boys had grown quite a bit in that year. And uh, so they're made up and, and one of them has a wig to, to try to match his hair from before. Then the whole idea of the spiders was an addition and a change from the book. The book did not have spiders in it. What was very uh, interesting about shooting these spiders is they were actual tarantulas. And uh, uh, one of a tarantula's natural defense mechanism is to uh, rub its legs together and give off a fine powder, which gave uh, about 80% of the crew has an allergic reaction to it. So everybody was uh, very puffy while this was all being shot, and it was really, uh, became quite a problem. It's not their bite, they rarely bite, and the bite isn't really that bad, but it's this uh, powder that causes the problems. Jan Kieser shot uh, the sequence, I believe. That's right. Because I was in, in Oklahoma with uh, Francis Coppola. This was about two, three weeks of shooting, quite an extensive sequence, as you can see, a number of cuts. There was an attempt also to, to build mechanical spiders, but really didn't work too well. And so as a result, about the only place you see the mechanical spiders are under the sheet. If you look carefully, you'll notice the boys look older here and there. They're taller. Uh, you take a look at their faces, they're, they're thinner, and so they had to be careful to shoot the boys at certain angles so you wouldn't realize that they'd grown. The two reaction shots of the boys going up, that was principal photography. You can see how different that their, their hair looks. I think the studio just felt the spiders was creepier and would add more of an edge to the film than the hand coming in. But a lot of this became subject of uh, a lot of debate and meetings. That was a uh, rare sunny day shot, Steve. Yeah, it was. This is a very, very small two-wall set that represented the church. There was also a sequence we shot where the boys go to the sheriff's office that it's not in the picture. Oh, that's right. Was that ever in the picture? I don't think so.
for us. We can't go home. They'd follow us and kill our folks. Again, it looks like you were blessed by sun, or did you wait for this? This was this was one of the sunny days, and we pulled back the silks because we wanted it to have a different look than when the carnival came to town. Hello. Dad, they're after us. Look, son, you come home. And I can't. The day we shot this, uh, Ray Bradbury's childhood friend, Ray Harryhausen, visited the set and with his wife and his, his daughter from England. Ray would always uh, visit the set almost every day and uh, cheer us on. Fantasy is a very special thing. And when you put it on the screen, you've got to be very careful. You don't have more than one element of fantasy. At the center of this film is the carousel. It makes you one year older every time it goes around forward. If it goes backward, it can make you one year younger. So the carousel is the center of the lives of all the people in this town. The young boys, young women would be attracted because they want to be older and become mature, become grown up overnight. And older people, threatened with death and with age, want to go backward on the carousel and make themselves younger. The closer you stay to that one element of fantasy, the carousel, and it's revolving forward or revolving backward, the more we can believe in what's going on in the film. This is back on the Disney lot. There was actually a section of the ground dug out for this basement underneath one of the barber shops, I believe. Hey, Charlie. Doc. Charlie, look here. The bar is in. First time in 20 years. A lot of glass, a lot of reflect reflections in this set. Uh, all the windows were, were double gimbaled so we could, we could move the glass any way we wanted to so we could get the reflections of cameras and lights out and also reflect uh, an interesting background. So you kind of got more out of your set by doing that. That seems like a good deal of foresight actually, doesn't it? Yes. Now we have a scene coming up where, for the first time, Jonathan Price and Jason Robards appear together on the screen. It's a very nice scene. It's very close to the scene in the novel and in my original screenplay. My name is Doc. I'm looking for two young boys. I got to know Jason Robards quite well during all this time of making the film, having lunch with him. I had lunch several times with Jonathan Price. But he was a very private person, a very shy person. I can't really say that I ever got to know him. My admiration was complete. And of course, in the final product, when you watch the film, uh, an immense gratitude to him for his job. Locked into my writing of such novels as Something Wicked This Way Comes is my background with Lon Chaney. When I was a child, the, the very first film I saw was The Hunchback of Notre Dame, 1923, the silent film. And then in 1925, uh, The Phantom of the Opera. So these films helped shape my life. All of Lon Chaney's films are embedded in my fiction and in my film writing. Uh, when he died when I was 10 years old, I thought it was the end of the world because I thought he was the greatest actor of all time. This is the sequence where you see the images of the little boys on Mr. Dark's hands. The still department took a couple of photos of the boys and then they were turned into stamps, rubber stamps, and they were stamped on his hand. 
and they were enhanced a little bit by the uh, by the makeup person who was actually on the location. At one time, somebody wanted to put uh, somebody notice. <laughs> I, I absolve myself from right. any blame. Right. Wanted to put effects animation on these, on top of these, but certainly that would have been a been a mistake. Yeah, fine boy, fine. Both of them quite a credit to this little town. If you want to know the truth, I do want to know the truth, sir. It's a good point to listen to James Horner's score of all the way through. Remarkable uh, musical interludes but with increasing intensity and beauty. I was present at the complete recording session of the score by James Horner and uh, was uh, very touched and moved by the beauty of these moments. Oh, yes. The town's librarian. I uh, have the honor, sir. And have had for many when he years, squeezes I... his hands together and the blood comes out in between, all that is is just a... Uh, is a little sponge with cosmetic blood on it. Only other men's dreams. What a waste. Sometimes a man can learn more from other men's dreams than he can from his own. Come visit me, sir, if you would uh, wish to improve your education. I will. It was wonderful to watch these two actors work because they were both very, very fine actors and they gave great performances. And Jack, with them, did... Uh, did more than his usual takes because they could do versions of the scene. When I say version of the scene, I mean that in one of them, maybe Jonathan would be very nasty and the next version, he would be very kind of light and threatening, but it gives uh, you know, a color to the performances that, uh, that uh, the director and the editors can choose later on to, to balance the picture off. Here is a good example of the not specific uh, situation where the little boy catches the football exactly like the bartender caught him, as though he didn't have the arm. That's what tips Jason Robart's character off to what, what's going on. Now we have upcoming the scene in the library, which to me is the most beautiful scene in the entire film. Uh, certainly the best scene I've ever seen shot in any of my pictures. A sublime performance by Jason Robard, a wonderful thing by Jonathan Price, and the use of this incredible library that was built from the ground up. Again, another Jack Clayton touch, a very poignant shot. The set that they built for the sequence in the library is an amazing piece of work. This is probably one of the most interesting scenes in the picture as far as performance and writing and effects and everything put together that really works as an, as an ensemble piece. Uh, and this really uh, tells you uh, about the story and what's going on. and. Uh, it's a very, very nice sequence. It was a lot of fun to do this scene because it was such a good scene. And, and when you were doing it, you knew how good it was and how powerful it was. And it just spurred you on to do your best. Poor lame servant girl went to the fortune teller to inquire how she might run. Her late the library night. sequence took the better part of a week to shoot. It was painstaking work. I think this is where Jack Clayton's genius really... Uh, came into full focus. This is a, an amazing piece of work. And uh, uh, this is the original version done on the first version of the film. And there was very little changes made. Some technical things were added, which I didn't approve of, but I was wrong. It's good to be able to admit where you are blind to the possibilities of a certain kind of change that would make the film work better. And the studio told me when they were doing the second version, they were gonna bring in the special effects people and add, 
you might say, fire and brimstone to the encounter between Dark and, uh, and Mr. Holloway. This is a grand set. This is a wonderful set. It's not often that you see sets where um, uh, there are a number of the vertical poles in it, which uh, certainly makes it, uh, uh, I'm sure, a little bit more difficult to light uh, because of the shadows and, and things like that. But it keeps it open and grand and elegant and also looks very authentic. And I can recall seeing uh, Richard McDonald's uh, drawings of this and it certainly was far more set than might normally be done with the rows of books going up so high. At this point, Mr. Dark is quoting from an old Christmas carol, We've Sung All of Our Lovers. Uh, I believe the title is, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Their old familiar carols play, and loud and deep the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. So that song has gone through my head many times over the years, and every time I hear it at Christmas time, it has brought tears to my eyes. Well, it's a very special reminder of the love and the eternal values of Christmas, which Mr. Dark is making fun of. So I think the words are very fitting here. This is very Shakespearean. This is wonderful. Where the way he walks away from us and he talks about all of the. And then he's lit from the warmth from below, isn't right. he, Steve? Yes. You make him look more ghoulish and strange. Instead of the innocent owner of the carnival, he becomes the devil. He's revealing himself now. But see, this is all played in one. Wonderful dialogue in this. The carnival lives off the negative energy of sinners. In other words, we have positive energy that we all survive on and negative energy which can kill us. I went on at great length in the novel about this, and when we did the sequence here, we had to shorten it, but the essence is still there. These are the hungry ones. They are attracted to the sins of the people, and they warm their hands and their hearts at the destruction and death and old age of people who don't know how to handle life. Watching this sequence and listening to it, I'm very proud because uh, it comes right out of the book, it comes right out of the original screenplay. It occurs on the screen just the way I wrote it and wanted it to be. Again, explaining more of the mystery of evil in the world and the problem of good and the confrontation of, of the two. That half man, he looked on goodness, tasteless fair. In a situation like this, ending up in, a, in an over-the-shoulder, we could have also ended up in a, a shared two-shot, be, but because Jack wanted to give each character his time, uh, he did it in over-the-shoulders. We can smell young boys ulcerating to When you see the, the smoke and the fire erupt from the pages, I thought, no, that's not going to work. It's going to look too, too cheap, too theatrical. But uh, I was totally wrong. It does work. It enhances the scenes and makes it more terrifying. This is an example of uh, how effects can be used to enhance and, and not dominate a sequence, which is always nice. This was an idea added uh, uh, much later in post-production to have the, uh, the glow on the pages. But it's, it's, it's a nice touch, and it's uh, subtle enough that it makes it even more effective. It's very, very tasty. It really, it really serves the story. It doesn't become the story itself. The glowing of the pages as they are torn out from the book is, uh, is done uh, as effects animation and specifically each frame of film has to be, uh, has to be hand drawn uh, so that you can make an exposure for each frame of film that exactly duplicates where the pages go. And to do that, uh, a rotoscoping technique is often employed and 
And uh, by that I mean you take the film itself and project it down onto a piece of paper for each frame and you trace around where the, where the particular pages go. And you have to do 24 frames for each second of film. And then having traced that, you then uh, re-photograph those pieces of animation paper with the tracings on them. And then you combine that in an optical printer and add the color and the glow and the diffusion or as one thing with the original film that you have projected. What is sometimes difficult in these types of sequences is it's very difficult to see it because it moves so fast. As he tears these pages, it's very quick and it's a blur. So as a result, the uh, rotoscoper uh, or effects animator is literally animating uh, the, the uh, movement from frame to frame because you, all you're seeing is a blur. So they have to both trace and do blurs. Then, of course, you have the reflected light on the other characters, the reflections of the, of the glows themselves. Quite a complex scene, although, again, just, just hopefully enhancing the overall dramatic impact of the sequence. In this scene, you see a prosthetics hand that is, that is being crushed, and it was made by the makeup department, Bob Shifford, and uh, as the hand is being squeezed tighter and tighter, you see the skin break, you see the bones come out, and uh, you also saw blood run out when we shot it, but I guess they, they felt it was too much for the picture. Originally, the, that was a little bit longer, and it was trimmed because they thought it was a little bit too, too ghoulish, too gory. How times have changed. <laughs> yes. When Dark finally seizes, Holloway's hand and breaks the bones in that fist. Uh, the bones in your hand, the structure of your heart is hurt and destroyed. This is a very wonderful set, wonderful iron work on all the railings and everything. And uh, the work on the bookcase is all the cabinetry. It's exactly like uh, all those libraries that uh, you remember when you're, you're a small child. Real iron uh, spiral staircase, beautiful, uh, beautiful work. Well, there was some animated lightning you put in the back to foreshadow the coming storm. Well, I grew up in a very small town in Central California, and we had one of the Carnegie libraries, and it was very much like this library. It had the same kind of wood. Uh, the same kind of chairs, the same kind of tables, the same kind of lights. It was, uh, it was very evocative for me because I used to love to go to the library a lot. I can guarantee you a very special reward. You can see the use of the zoom lens here closed in on the little boys. That's why we had to light at the 200 foot candles. In the day they tore the library down, when the film was over, it broke my heart because I wanted to stay up forever and use it in all kinds of films because the library is the center of my life. I never made it to college, so I grew up in the library and stayed there and went to the library three or four days a week until I was 28 years old, and then I graduated from the library. The first time we tried this, that the, uh, the bookcase was not anchored down and uh, it started to come over on the top of Jonathan, so we had to have the grips really, really uh, make it very, very secure. We thought it was going to be secure with the books in it, but uh, we were wrong. Again, it's fascinating here. Once the Horner music is locked in place, I can't imagine any other score being used, even though there was one before this. Uh, but this is the final, and this is the beauty. The lighting treatment on uh, the sequence is very much like the Val Luton pictures. The cat people in uh, I Walk with a Zombie, old horror film where you have a lot of uh, hard, uh, hard shadows and patterns projected on the wall. It was very popular in the 40s. Again, the same treatment on the dust witch. 
She starts out in silhouette and then comes into this light to reveal her face. Now in the sequence with the Dust Witch, it was originally shot with no special effects. But when I saw the rough cut, I said, it's got to be that the Dust Witch has dust coming out of her fingertips. So please, in order for her to hypnotize the boys, it's not only what she says, but we've got to believe that she's evoking the, the hypnosis through the dust that comes from her hands. The sound of his heart was made louder at a later date. Right at the end of the scene here where she slows down, it's, uh, it's step printed, that is double framed or triple framed, so she slows down and has an eerie kind of quality as she approaches him. Again, effects animation on the ring. All this effects animation is very labor intensive and uh, Lee Dyer, who is uh, in charge of the visual effects uh, and, and the effects animation, had a crew of about uh, 20, 25 animators working on this. And here we have the introduction again of the metaphor of the wonderful barber pole. And when you put out the light, you put out the light of life. That was an uh, in-camera effect where you saw the, uh, the barber pole being put out and then a gust of wind we shot in. Having the wind on uh, the character's hair is uh, is a very important element. You feel like you're outside, you feel like the storm is coming, but it plays hell for the sound man because all the dialogue has to be added later on. We'll ride him backward, shall we? Turn him into a little baby. Plaything for our little friend here. You can see the, uh, the hair moving on Jason's head uh, as though the door to the library was left open. Almost all the atmospheric shots from here on were done at a later date because, again, we had failed to make the audience believe in what was going on. More effects animation and cloud tank footage. Uh with a matte painting foreground. This is all second unit work here. Scene done very uh, efficiently again in a two shot. The miniature photography was shot high speed and that is when you run a camera at high speed and then project it at normal speed, everything slows down and this will always give a certain amount of scale to something. There's a tremendous amount of wind and a tremendous amount of smoke added to it. In addition to that, you you throw some dust in and hopefully uh, that really gives you a sense of scale. And if you've accomplished it right, it will cut in with the full scale footage that was also shot during principal photography. And, and if you look closely, the way you tell the miniature stuff from the full scale stuff is that in the miniature stuff you see no people. This is a Miramay sequence that was shot uh, with two versions. The first version we did with just mirrors and uh, sections of, of glass. And uh, Jack Clayton hired a lot of extras who were old men who had false teeth and he had them uh, take their false teeth out for the, for the scene. And the, the studio felt that it was uh, too... Uh, too heavy for the picture, and so uh, they shot another uh, mirror maze situation. And in our version of the mirror maze, we didn't have these oval mirrors. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, coming up with a design where you wouldn't see the camera and you didn't need 
any of these little areas to hide things in. And it was quite effective, but uh, I think that uh, the studio was so, see there, there's the clear, there's the clear glass idea. The idea of the ovals was to again, be a little less ambiguous so that you actually knew they were mirrors. Um, I don't know if it was really necessary, but uh, it helped the fact to see these uh, optical projections put into ovals rather than to just pieces of glass uh, or uh, might appear to be floating. So again, it was to try to uh, clear up some confusion. Of all the football years, all his cheering crowds gone. Here, the looking glass of pride and ruin. There's a little bit of that other sequence uh, uh, left in here. Because the, the original idea was that Jason Robards keeps feeling older and older and older and older and he's being chased by all of these, these old men and it's his own, his own frailty as a, as a human being that, that happens. He sees, the, he sees a replay of what he considers his greatest failure, not jumping in the river and saving his son. The footage of the boy in the river was, uh, again, supplemental footage done uh, many months after principal that's photography. A, yeah, that's a double in the foreground. And it's not really the boy. In fact, it's uh, one of the production people who had to jump in the river, and he's about six foot four. So it just goes to show you what you can get away with when somebody's swimming. And as a man, your son hates you. Your son hates you. Your son hates you. Hates you. You've lost him. You've lost him. He's mine. He's mine. And young Jim Nightshade too. Jim Nightshade too. Drown, Halloway. Halloway. Drown, Halloway. Drown. Drown. Obviously, that shot is the one that replaced all the old men, and you also see the wig. I rewrote the scenes in the mirror maze. The Halloway character, seeing his son behind the glass, under the water, in the river. He's got to break through and pull his son out intact and save his life. The Holloway character has got to take a chance on cutting himself even more intensely, perhaps endangering his own life so that he can rescue his son. Now this, uh, this, breaking, this breaking of the glass was done with, uh, with a couple of high-speed cameras. You'll see at the end of the sequence, you'll see them uh, uh, running toward each other with all this breaking, this right here. That's, that's a layover. Tom Fury shouldn't be doing the destroying here. It's up to the boys, it's up to the father. In the original novel, I had the father kill the dust witch with a bullet from a, uh, a rifle which is marked with the symbol of a heart of, of love of the family. This sequence was changed quite significantly, and it wasn't originally the, uh, the, the breaking glass that you see here. This is, of course, effects animation frame by frame, and uh, as well as the reflected light. The glass that was dropped towards camera separately added to the scene. In principal photography, we, we lined up a series of sheets of uh, of tempered glass and then shot through them with a very, very long lens and shot it at 128 frames. And we dropped each one of these sheets of glass and we ended up in, the, in that shot that you saw, but it's not, uh, it's not in the picture. You actually saw the father and the son running toward each other through this breaking glass and then they, they grab each other. In the original carousel sequence coming up here, the audience laughed. It went on and on. The uh, juxtaposition of shots was very poor, and we had inadvertent laughter all through the sequence. I learned from some of the Eugene O'Neill films that were made 30, 40 years ago, Morning Becomes Electra, where one more suicide, one more murder, one more poisoning, one more incest turned the whole thing into an inadvertent comedy. I said, we have the same problem here. We're giving too much information to the audience. They're overwhelmed, they're smothered, they're drowned in it. If we could find a way of editing the sequence so that we would separate certain shots and relieve the audience of the burden of too much information, 
and then go back and forth between dark and the boys and the father. Maybe we can cure the laughter. And thank goodness it worked. When we shot the coverage of the boy and his father, we did it against the carousel to make, to make you feel that you were still in the environment instead of cutting away the other way against the wall. All the things you see toward the ending here were things that were added in the second version. All the special effects with the thunder, with the lightning, with the people running. Uh, these are all additional things that had to be done later and inserted. Again, in the original version, change in makeup was uh, done as, as a practical. In other words, it was just done in cuts and there was no effects animation added to it. We had multiple cameras when we were doing the wind effects with people running through and the ponies and all of that stuff. We normally shot maybe two or three cameras on that, that stuff because it's very, very difficult to, uh, to repeat it. We had some pretty elaborate mechanical effects pulling over the tents on the stage with big, uh, with big cables and things like that and wind. dust blowing through. You'll notice that when the little dwarf picked up Mr. Dark, that the, the wind was not blowing the canvas, but that was supposed to be at the end of the cutting sequence, so the wind had quit. But uh, the way it was cut into the picture is in the wrong place for what we shot. The miniature of the carnival is about sixth scale. It's pretty big, and we hung it from the top of the stage from 25 feet up and had pins in place that held all the bits of the carnival together with the camera also upside down. As you released each pin, the miniature would fall to the ground and appear to be going upwards. The Ferris wheel also was a miniature. This was four times printed and then with a, with a separate element of a mat extracted of them. This cloud tank was built specially and uh, down the bottom was basically a propeller. It would act like uh, water going down a drain. It, it spun so fast that it would create a vortex. If you added the paint very uh, carefully at the top of the tank, it would then spin around and go down this vortex towards the bottom, and this became the tornado itself. Begin second unit work. With a matte painting of a dawn sky, very bright and very red, it was the intention at the time to try to duplicate the red of the leaves here. Back to the original metaphor, the father, the son, and the good friend running into the town, approaching the barber shop, coming up to the barber pole, which has been dead now for quite a few hours. And when they all touch the barber pole, it comes alive again. And life restarts. And there's a promise of tomorrow. And the hope that the carnival won't come back. The last shot of the picture, we were very lucky. We had a very, very good sky. But this old film was not great at uh, rendering uh, the difference between light and dark. So I had to put a very heavy neutral density on the top of the uh, of the frame in order to get uh, the shadow balanced with the highlight. I would have loved to have done a crane shot at the end, but you would have seen the, the graduate neutral ride against the, the buildings in the sky. So I just opted for the great sky. So there it is. It was uh, certainly a, a, an interesting film to work on and you don't often get the chance to work on something quite like this. It has a great history to it coming from such a well-known book. It doesn't quite seem like it was 15 years ago that it was done, but it was a great deal of fun at the time. The bottom line in all this is that out of all this perspiration, we finally made a film that I'm proud of. I mean, uh, yes, are some of the flaws still there? They most certainly are. But the final thing is a film that I'm glad to tell people to look at. It's a good film. Don't get me wrong, I love it very much. And the film has a reputation. Thank you. <laughs>